Um, thank you very much um, for the invitation to speak. I mean, I've invited myself really, as I usually do. It's, 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 a, it's a pleasure to be here again. Um, I have to click something, right? Okay. I'm, um, well, I'm, I'm going to um, speak today about uh, mostly my uh, most recent work with, with Roger Penrose, which uh, builds on um, many years, if not decades, of Roger's thinking about fundamental problems in, um, in quantum mechanics. And the, maybe the, the, the novelty of the modest proposal we have is to um, bring these this quantum ideas of Roger together with, with Twister theory. I mean, you'll, I'll be more specific about this in due course, but both Twister theory and, and quantum mechanics are um, non-local quantum mechanics inherently non-local at the quantum level twister theory gives a fairly unorthodox description of space-time which is non-local also at classical level in that um, you know it, it is not the space-time event which is regarded as as fundamental in physics but light ray instead and space-time event is a derived object which which brings some sense of non-locality and the conversion of twister theory which will feature in this talk will be a limit of, of this theory where the speed of light um, becomes infinite of so newtonian twisters um, i'll um, you know I'll, I'll start off by, by explaining what what i understand to be quantum mechanics according to, to penrose so you know you're most of us many of us would have thought about these issues and uh you know, I, I don't really have, you know, a, a, a well-established view myself. So here I'm just, I'm just like a messenger passing on my understanding of what it is Roger regards as, as, as um, you know, important in quantum physics. So I, I think it, it, it's just fair to say and not controversial that quantum evolution or quantum mechanics uh, is described at, at, at two levels. There is the, the unitary evolution, which Roger reversed, refers to as the U process. And that's linear and, um, and, and holomorphic in that uh, the complex conjugation of the wave function doesn't come to, 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 to its description and is governed by the Schrodinger, time dependent Schrodinger equation. And this is the process which we um, you know, mathematically and physically we think we understand very well. And then, but then there is the other kind of process, the R process, R stands for reduction, which. Um, which is the wave function collapse and, and has to do with, with measurement. Um, and that is that goes beyond holomorphic quantum mechanics and is definitely not described by, uh, by Schrodinger equation. And it is, it is Roger's view about this R process, which is maybe unorthodox. So he, he, would, uh, he would regard the R process as, as a you know, real physical process, not some state change in a state of our um, um, understanding of state. And it's not, in his view, an instantaneous process. It's a process which takes time and takes place in time. We can think of it taking place between two um, measurements. And, uh, and Roger's view is that the conventional quantum mechanics is, is incomplete in that it does not give us uh, the explanation of how this R process works. So um, to, 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 th there is a more concrete proposal which, which Rogers put forward over, um, over 25 years ago. And his view is that uh, the gravity, to explain this R process, the gravitational effects have to be taken um, into account. And these are kind of classical gravitational um, effects. And, and why? It, it, it is because we, we, we seem to be observing um, more and more so in the last 20 years experimentally superpositions of, of very small quantum states like electrons or photons but we don't observe superpositions of heavy states so you know what makes the difference between heavy and light well it's a mass so if it is really a mass which comes to it one needs to bring in a theory describing mass and that's gravity but again i'll be i'll be more specific about where exactly this gravity should uh, come into this and um, now what is um, what, what should be stressed here is that the, the, the idea behind 
behind these proposals of Roger is not to, um, not, not to quantize gravity, not to try to quantize gravity, uh, but, 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 but rather to incorporate gravity in the existing quantum mechanics. So we, with a view of modifying quantum mechanics by presence of gravity. So Roger refers to this as gravitizing quantum mechanics rather than quantizing um, gravity. So that's, that's, the, that's the kind of theme in which this talk is. Now, what, what I'll talk about more specifically today. Um, so there, one, one, so Roger has this criticism, but, but, but and he's quite honest, but he's got no model which addresses all these criticisms. But, but, but there are some specific kind of mathematical consequences of, of, the, of the Schrodinger equations and, and equivalence principle, which he pointed out, which, which lead to certain phase inconsistencies. Um, so the first thing I'll try to explain to you is that these phase inconsistencies which were observed and have noted for uniform gravitational field are quite, quite robust and, and they don't depend on what gravitational field you take into account. The, kind of the, 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 the cubic in phase anomaly which Roger observed uh, um, is, is, is always present. Uh, this, um, this description and this phase ambiguity only requires Newtonian classical gravity framework. So it, 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 is, it is already present in weak gravitational field. So, and, and that's the kind of where, where this, this recent work of ours fits in. The idea is to incorporate a Newtonian version of twister theory, which gives Newtonian with non-local descriptions of all Newtonian space times. Now I'll talk about twister theory um, a bit later, and you know it, it, it's a great theory, which although it started off as, as a theory of physics, it evolved into um, geometry, pure mathematics, and the main obstruction of you know, applying twister theory to, to real classical physics is that if, if the, the space-time metric is curved, then, um, then it has to be conformally flat to admit twisters if, you know, if the signature of the space-time is Lorentzian. There are curved versions of twister theory, but they only apply to complexified setup or Euclidean signature. So there is this, technically speaking, self-duality obstruction um, to uh, applying twister theory to real solutions of Einstein's equations. Well, it turns out that this obstruction disappears in the Newtonian limit, and, and there is a, a curved twister theory describing in a non-local way all Newtonian spacetimes. Um, and and the, the, the punchline, the, the proposal for uh, some sort of explanation of the R process will combine the quantum non-locality with the twister non-locality in, 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 into something which aims to describe a twister, well, at the twister level, the collapse of the wave function. Um, okay, so, so let's, let's start off with quantum particle moving in a classical um, uniform gravitational field. And um, so, I, I, so this, this bold G is just, just constant. And you, if, if you want to, you can think of this really as a one space dimensional problem. So you could choose this vector G to be zero, zero, one, and then you only have, let's say the Z variable, but, but you, could, you, could, you could also just take a constant gravitational field like this. So I, I, I refer to this um, as a Newtonian frame. Why? Well, because there is, there is another frame which, in which you can consider the same physical problem, and that's the accelerating frame. Roger refers to this as the Einstein frame. So you know, it's not a Galilean transformation, but, but it, 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 it's a transformation which, 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 which you know, brings acceleration into this. There is a non-zero second derivative of the position vector with respect to time. And now it's, you know, it, it, physically it's, 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 it's justified if, if you look at this quantum problem from the perspective of this free falling particle, but what happens at the level of computation and that requires sort of chain rule for differentiation is that you, you, you'll convince yourself that um, in this new frame, um, it's not this 
wave function little psi, but a, a different wave function, capital psi, which satisfies Schrodinger equation with no potential. Okay, and, and, the, and the remarkable thing is, is, is that there is a phase difference between capital psi and little psi, and this phase difference is cubic in time. Now, this um, suggests that you have to make up your mind which of these two frames um, you're going to be using in, in the description of the quantum particle, because if you were to try to use both, you, you, you're at risk of, of encountering an ambiguity. See, if, I mean, this is not quantum field theory, but quantum mechanics. But if you were to e extrapolate um, some of these ideas, and that can be done to quantum field theory, you, you would be, um, no, you would want to make a decomposition of fields into positive and negative frequency states. And, and these decompositions you know, would, would be altered by, by this nonlinear time dependence. But, you know, as, yes. In the conference, there are two sides. One is capital yes. and one is little. Yes. And in the Schrodinger equation, the one is on the left-hand side. The little. Ah, I'm so sorry, there's a typo. That, that, that should be a capital side. I, 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 yeah, I, I apologize. Right, so, so but, but there is, you know, there, it's, it's an observation, but there is no problem so far because what you can say and what one does is that, is that you, you choose one frame or the other and you use it for your computation. Well, um, and, and you know, this, this ambiguity in positive and negative frequency, the compositions, can be thought of, and that's an interesting exercise in itself, which, which actually can be performed, can be thought of as the C goes to infinity limit of the, of the Unruh effect. So, you know, it, 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 it's, it's been known for, for a long time in, in quantum field theory that the, the, the concept of positive frequent, negative frequency and even the very concept of a particle and particle number is, is, is observer dependent. And there are, you know, it, it, it's known as like of unradiation, so an accelerating observer, the, 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 the particle number detected by the accelerating observer um, is, is different than that in a kind of stationary observer. And th this is the kind of non-relativistic non artifact of this. Now, where, where um, what kind of the novelty and due to Roger comes to this is if you if you were to think of a superposition of two massive objects, uh, then th th these objects, you know, there'll be some gravitational self-interaction between these objects and, and this, this gravitational, so, so you, you would need to choose then a frame either related to one of the object or the or superposed version of it. And, um, you know, you, you then really would not know which of these states, which, which of these frames to use to perform your quantum field theory calculation. And where still you would encounter states which describe, you know, which belong strictly speaking to two different Hilbert spaces. And that is because the notion of stationarity uh, would depend on which of these massive objects you, you choose. And, and Roger argues that this, this inconsistency uh, can only last for finite but short time and that's what triggers the wave function collapse. Um, so, you know, I think up, up, up to here, it, it's, it's a fairly firm, very simple mathematics. And, and, and this is a big, big, big step Roger takes to actually point out that this leads to this leads to problems if you try to consider superpositions of massive But Well, what, what I'd like to, Tell you about, and this is moving more into kind of maths GR directions, is this these considerations and this cubic in time quantum ambiguity in phase is not specific to uniform gravitational fields, but uh, but but can be you know observed for any gra any Newtonian gravitational fields. And to do that, um, let, let's consider a plane wave space-time in four plus one dimensions. Uh, um, so, so there is, you know, there are three plus one dimensions which will end up corresponding to physical space, X and T, and there is another direction, and those of you who worked with plane waves will notice that, that this 
U um, translation in U uh, corresponds to a null isometry. So little d by du is, is a null killing vector, which is covariantly constant. Uh, now, th this particular form of metric is, um, I mean, it's been an interesting history. It's been discovered and rediscovered by, by, by many people. And to most, I, 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 until maybe 10 years ago, those, those of us who have knew it would attribute it to the, the French school of, of Christian Duval and his, and his students, collaborators, Gary Gibbons to some extent. It was then pointed out that this the, the, the procedure I'm just about to describe was discovered by Eisenhardt in, in um, Annals of Mathematics paper from 1928. Uh, of course, it was also discovered again about six, seven years ago by string theorists doing kind of condensed matter physics who you know, claimed this and, 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 and told us that those who discovered it before didn't really understand it. But, but here it is, it's quite simple. Uh, and um, so what, how does it link to physics in four dimensions? Well, it, it does so in two ways, at classical and quantum levels. So what, one simple calculation is that if, if you were to look for null geodesics of these plane wave metrics and project them down to, um, to the XT space, uh, then you, you, you'd find that the geodesic equations imply uh, that in the XT space, uh, you have of unparameterized trajectories, I mean, unparameterized because T is one of the space-time dimensions of a Newtonian um, particle. Okay? So, so you can, this sometimes is referred to as a null kaluza klein reductions because you're aiming to explain physics in um, lower dimensions by, uh, by some, you know, some geometry of higher dimensions, but, but the, the kind of novelty of this, well, was different in this approach, was different between this and the Kaluza Klein framework, is that your the, the reduction, the quotient is along the null direction um, d by d u. Now, what, what what we'll be interested in is the kind of the quant quantum physics arising from this. So it's also a, a straightforward calculation to show that if you take um, a function which is in the kernel of the wave operator for this metric G. And you also in, impose an invariance condition of this function along translations with respect to this null direction u. So essentially you want, you want the lead derivative of little phi along d by du. It will be some constant times little phi, which leads to these ansatz. Then uh, you know, working with the wave operator for capital G, you'll find that psi satisfies time-dependent Schrodinger equation with potential B. Okay, so, you know, it's an interesting metric and that, that will work in, in any dimension. So, you know, this Eisenhardt lift, they call them in N plus one dimensions, describes either, you know, classical trajectories or wave functions in N dimensions. Now, why is, I mean, how does that connect to, to, to the earlier observation of Rogers? Well, um, it gives a, a kind of a ge geometric mechanism or understanding why, um, why this accelerating frame sort of exists. So if, if you take the potential in the Eisenhardt metric to be linear, corresponding to the uniform field, then you'll find that the, the Eisenhardt plane wave metric is flat. I mean, it's flat, but it's not written down in flat coordinates because you have this potential, but, but you'll know that flat coordinates exist. And so, so you can look for them, and it's, it's not too difficult. Well, it's not difficult at all to find them explicitly. They're given by this transformation, and here you you see that the t transformation and the x transformation is that which takes you to the accelerating frame. But what's of importance to us is the the transformation of this null direction that transforms fairly complicated way. But the consequence of this, if you put it together with this answers here is the, the, the space ambiguity. So you take a what I call capital phi, which is a function in the kernel of the wave operator. And you know, to say that something is in the kernel of the wave operator, you don't need to refer to any coordinates. You can then either express it in terms of the Eisenhardt metric in flat coordinates, capital U, T and X, or with respect to the 
initial coordinates. And, and the diff if you then take this capital U and see how it depends on little u, then you'll see that there is a time-dependent phase difference between these two functions. And that's the, tape, the, 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 the phase difference Roger referred to. Okay. Yes. Is the metric G supposed to satisfy tension? No. Because because what what no what what what's your message is whatever whatever Newtonian potential you're given, you'll be looking at this metric for this Newtonian potential and um, you know and and understanding this equation or this equation from the point of view of this metric. Um, if it were to satisfy Einstein equations, then you'll find that, um, you know, this is new, that V can be flat, but V can be also one over R. Um, right, so, so now um, how, do you, um, how do you use it to, to, to see what the phase difference would be for general potential? Well, if, if you take V to be general, then G is not flat, it's curved. It's actually quite interesting to, to look at the intermediate case, which is something I've been doing for the last couple of months, where G is not flat, but conformally flat. But I, I'm going to leave that bit um, aside. It has to do with the situ space. But, 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 but in general, it's, it's not flat, it's curved. Well, then you don't have flat coordinates, but the next, next best thing are the Riemann normal coordinates. So, so these are, you know, normal coordinates are coordinates so that at the point, so normal coordinates centered at the point are such that the components of the Christoffel symbols at this point vanish. I mean, it's okay because Christoffel symbols, they're not tensors. For this Riemann version of normal coordinates, you don't only have that, but, but your, well, you, you claim that the metric to to the kind of second order in these coordinates is given by a, a multiple of the Riemann tensor with one index lower, right? So these, these are the these are the so that there is a proof that these coordinates always exist and are unique, um, and and it's determined to this order where where R is evaluated at the origin of this normal coordinate system. Okay, so this so we we, we, we we so proposing that this Riemann normal coordinates will lead to. It, the, the coordinate system, which is analogous to this Einstein free falling frame. Now, you, you then, well, you, you then take the Eisenhardt metric and you compute um, using Maple um, this coordinate transformation you know, to new u, new x, and new t. And you, you find some expressions and you see that, that there is this cubic term in time present in these expressions. And, and it, it, it's multiplied by this well, vector, which I call gamma i. Um, later on, uh, I, we might be in interpreting this gamma i as the non-vanishing components of the Newton-Carton Newtonian um, connection. So, so there is, you know, so, so the, the, the punchline of this calculation is that the, um, the phase ambiguity, if you then compare the two elements, Question yes. Those yes. So, so um, I think that those coordinates satisfy some some more. Okay. Uh, Riemann tensor has only has non-zero components only for the x. It doesn't have for u or t. Sorry. The mm, look. The what I called x alpha mm -hmm. oh, is oh, is a combination. Oh, yes. Okay. So, 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 you know, so, so now you really have to compute it. Um, right, right. So, so, so in these normal coordinates, you, you, you can then well, see what the kernel of the, of the wave operator is, where you need to use capital U for your ansatz, and you compare it with the original coordinates. And, and, and then you find that the corresponding wave function um, to lowest order, um, differ by this phase transformation, and this phase transformation is cubic in time. So, so the observation that this cubic in time term is there for the uniform field is, is um, you know, robust if you are if you if you're using this Newton-Cartan connection gamma instead. 
Okay, so that, that's one message. Uh, now, now I'm going to move on to take a more ma mathematically uh, well, interesting, interesting things and talk twister theory. So twister theory, as, as we know it, was um, invented by Roger in late 60s, you know, to be a, a, a non-local theory of physics, space-time. Um, the point is that the you know, if you use twisters at, at classical level, you're forced to use um, complex numbers, so they appear quite naturally. And Roger's view was, and maybe still is, that um, that's a good thing because in quantum mechanics, complex numbers also appear naturally. So if you want to have a theory you know, combining the two, you might want to have a mathematical formalism which is, which is similar. I mean, there are other motivations for twisters, but this is one. It's a non-local theory of space-time in which light rays are more fundamental um, than events. And, and it, it's very successful in describing linear physics of you know, solutions to linear field equations like um, wave, Maxwell, but also higher spin. Um, and it's also uh, very successful at describing nonlinear differential equations. In fact, there is a school of thought which suggests that all integrable systems as we um, as we know them uh, have their own twister description and this all is you know, it's a paradigm of what integrability means but um, but the, but there you're sort of moving away from physics because this um, non perturbative physics is 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 constrained by self duality of either the um, riemann tensor um, if the if twisters are applied to curve space time or by the young mills tensor if you apply them to solutions to young mills equations and this self duality is a, is a property of curvature either einstein or young mills which 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 is only kind of non non trivial in a non lorentzian signature so it's you can have self dual um, gauge fields or self dual metrics in euclidean signature or in plus plus minus minus signature but non in, not in Lorentzian signature. So that's a bit of a drawback, which has not been um, resolved. But, but, but the theory has had a huge impact on pure mathematics, you know, ranging from differential geometry to things like representation theory. And then you know, you, if you look at twister, well, th th there is also this, this um, sort of more recent, well, sadly not that recent anymore, uh, the, the, um, revolution which which was initiated by Witten and led to applications of twister techniques to to cal cal calculations of scattering amplitudes but these are in um so yes uh the sub, because the word duality and sub duality yes. are used in multiple contexts does that mean that uh, when i take a hot dual uh then i get uh, that that is the same as the field right uh, well, it's the same as the field, or minus or the same. The, so, so the, the the field is the the, the two form is an eigen vector with some eigen value mm -hmm. of of the, of the Hodge operator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, that's right. And uh, you know, if you at this level of thinking, then the kind of obstruction I'm I'm alluding to here is that the or the, the on, on two forms the the square of the Hodge dual, mm -hmm. what it is that depends on the signature of space time. And in, in the signatures, which I mentioned, Euclidean and plus plus minus minus, the Hodge star in four dimensions squares to an identity operator. So its eigenvalues can be plus or minus one. But in Lorentzian signature, it squares to minus identity. So the eigenvalues are plus and minus i. So you can have an, you know, eigenvectors, which are self-dual and the self dual but they're necessarily complex. Right, so so that's you know so so twister theory in in is, is constrained by this self duality. However, there is a limit of this theory where the speed of light tends to infinity. Something I well helped my research student James Gundry to develop five years ago. Um, and what happens in this um, Newtonian limit? Is you know that, so that's, that, that's a mathematical terminology. You'll find that the, the curves in the twister space, which correspond to space-time points, they're still curves, but their holomorphic type changes in, in, in algebraic geometry. That's referred to as the jumping line. So each each twister curve corresponding to space-time event um, 
is, is described by what's called the normal bundle, which, um, which, which, which is the sum of two line bundles in, in, in the classical case, this is O1 plus O1. And it turns out that at the holomorphic level, C goes to infinity limit is, is regular as far as a smooth structure of twister space is concerned, but at the holomorphic level, it changes the type of this normal bundles. Um, this um, Newtonian non-relativistic twisters are an unstable under holomorphic deformations of the twister space. So if, if you were not all deformations, but some generic deformations, if you were to deform a, a, a Newtonian twister space, you'll find that the, the twister lines jump back into relativistic twister space. So there is, I mean, I, I think I understand this step mathematically quite well, but, but, but I don't know whether there is any um, physics, deeper physics behind it at all, but it appears that at the twister level, Newtonian physics is unstable it, 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 with the generic physics being relativistic. But, but they, they have a good thing, an attractive thing about this theory is that unlike this self-duality constraint, there are no such constraints for Newtonian spacetime. So all Newtonian spacetimes are described by this theory. And, and to really put your hands on what, what, this, what these twister spaces are and how to get Newtonian connection and all that, you, you, you have to be taking uh, non-relativistic limits of gravitational instances. And I'm going to give you an example of why, you know, why, why is that important in a calculation. Um, okay, so, so now this, this slide will be a bit technical, but, but here you are. I, I, I'm going to define a twister space for you. It will be a twister space for flat space time, but I, I want to do it for you know, keeping the speed of light explicit. So it's not just one twister space I'm defining, but the one parameter family of twister space parameterized by, uh, by a number C. And um, how do you well, how do you describe a, a, a manifold? Well, um, if if that manifold can be covered by two open sets, then you'll describe it by a patching relation between um, these two open sets. Uh, it, it's a complex threefold, so I'm giving you three complex coordinates uh, covering one of these open sets and three complex coordinates covering another open set. So this still does are you know, the independent uh, from bars. There is no complex conjugation involved. And I'm declaring uh, PTC to be a complex manifold given by this patching, okay? That's my definition. Now, if you focus on just this relation between lambda tilde and lambda, you, you'll see that this is, you, you recognize it as the holomorphic patching of a Riemann sphere. So a two-dimensional sphere, is a complex manifold, which you can see, for example, by taking a stereographic projection and using a complex coordinate on the plane. Well, if you were to project from South Pole and then from North Pole, and you wanted to relate the resulting complex co coordinates, uh, that would be the relation, okay? But, but, but then there is this complex patching between these two other coordinates, T and Q. Now, um, what sort of manifold is it, this PTC? Well, it, 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 it's a vector bundle. In fact, it's a holomorphic vector bundle over a complex projective line. So this lambda or lambda tilde um, are coordinates on this holomorphic projective line. And then T and Q or T tilde and Q tilde are coordinates on the fibers of this um, projective line. And, uh, and, and this complex manifold has this patching function, which is essentially why I'm repeating this formula here. Now, um, there is a theorem of, of Grothendieck uh, that all, um, all vector bundles over a complex projective line um, are um, direct sums of these line bundles, which are called ON. And if you're, uh, is there a, yeah, I mean you, you can you can define this so make quite important. Yeah, yeah. I cannot do it, right? Yeah. But I think I think all I need is, is just this little slot. All I um so I I'll, I'll be using this equation O N, and you can think of them 
as line bundles, well, they are line bundles over CP1 with transition function uh, lambda to the minus n. Okay, a a another description of those is that you're, you know, you're, you'll think that CP1 is an um, equation of C2 minus zero, uh, by an equivalence relation. So you identify two points in C2, which lie on the line, the same line through the origin. If you do that, then you can take functions on C2, which are homogeneous, homogeneous polynomials of degree n. And these functions are sections of, um, of this line bundle so n. So that's in a, one way to define a line bundle is to tell what all its sections are. So it's either this or that procedure. And there is also more kind of Troutman style description of these bundles where you introduce a connection and you compute the churn class of this connection and you find that this churn class is, is N, right? But, but for me, I don't need any connections in this bundle. Anyway, the, 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 this space PTC has to be a direct sum of, 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 in this case, two of those because it's a rank two bundle. So you say which two? Um, well, um, if, uh, I mean, there are two cases to consider where C is infinity and C is not infinity. So the, the, the way Grothendieck tells us to go about it is for such a patching function, you want to put it in the diagonal form and you put it in the diagonal form by you know, pre-multiplying it on, on the left and on the right by matrices which are holomorphic in U tilde and U open sets. Now, if C is infinity, then you don't need to find this H and H tilde because you will see that FC is already in F infinity is in this canonical form and you recognize PTC as O plus O2. Um, if C is not infinity, then you, you find after some calculation that it is um, equal to O1 plus O1. Now, why am I making a big deal out of all this? Well, this total space of a vector bundle O1 plus O1 is, is just one of the many equivalent definitions of Penrose's twister space for a um, complexified Minkowski space. But here, this is kind of applicable to any value of the speed of light, although the description of it is rather non-standard. I mean, even you know, if, if you've seen um, Rogers' equations of the form um, of the form omega a equals x a a prime pi a prime, which is usually his starting point called the incidence relation, um, you, you would need to do some work with this omega a and pi a primes to calculate of q and p, but they essentially it's equivalent. So, so, so the, the, way, the way capital Q arises from omega is you need to choose a, a time direction and take some quadratic with respect to time direction. Now, so, so what, is the, what is this twister correspondence now between this one parameter family of twister spaces and, um, um, and, and, and space time? How does space time emerge? Well, these twister spaces, they, they admit a four parameter family um, of curves of CP1s. And you declare the curves in the CP1s in the twister space to be points in, um, in, 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 in MC, space time. And here is the kind of expression for this four parameter family that's in one of these open sets in U. You could write similar expressions uh, with U tilde. Now, if C is not equal to infinity, then you can define a conformal structure on MC declaring. So, so you know, how do you define a conformal structure? One way to do it is to write down the metric. And, and say that you only look for this metric up to an overall non-zero positive scale. Another way to define a conformal structure is to decide which, you know, whether two points in your manifold um, can be connected by a null, uh, not, not necessarily null geodesic, but just null curve. 
Okay, so, so I need to define a concept of null separation. And, and you do it by this kind of algebraic geometry methods. You say that two points in MC are now separated if and only if the corresponding curves, the curves intersect at one point. You see, um, you, you know, although I talk about complex manifolds, you can use your real life intuition. If you have a three dimensional space and lines and two lines or two curves in it, generically two, two lines curves in three dimensions do not intersect. I mean, they can intersect, but it's, it's, it's a non-generic kind of co-dimension one condition. So, uh, so, so it is this condition which defines this conformal structure. And if you do the calculation, uh, you know, based on a single intersection of two such lines, you find that this conformal structure is the familiar looking one. So it's this up to an overall scale, which, which, which only now, I think, it justifies me claiming that what I referred to as the parameter C is the speed of light. I mean, it is because it comes down in the right conformal structure. Now, this was all kind of complex. You can then impose some reality conditions on this twister space uh, um, in, in terms of this anti-holomorphic involution and look at curves which are invariant under this involution call them real and that's that's and then the kind of reality condition i'm giving you here would actually lead to um euclidean signature metrics now what happened what's interesting for us is what happens in, in in a case where c is infinity well what's special about so there was something special about these patching functions for the twister space you know it, it was it, it it led to this o plus o2 description but what happens um here at the level of, of these twister curves is you'll see that this twister function t and also t tilde they the same. So there is a global twister function corresponding to time in space time. And you also find with some more work that there is a, um, a, a vibration of this now real space times over a real line. And um, you know, when you identify the coordinate or really a one for me on this real line, uh, with, with a clock. So this, you know, this, this in, in C goes to infinity limit, you're, you don't get a conformal structure on space time, but you have at the very least notion of time simultaneity. And what you also get is the generate metric, in fact, the inverse metric on, on, the, on, the, on the fibers of this vibration. So you know, in, in, in Newtonian physics, it, it makes sense to say that for, for fixed time, um, well, you, you can calculate the kind of Euclidean distance between two points as long as they correspond to a fixed time. And uh, so they're simultaneous. And, and this, this distance calculation is based on this degenerate metric. Okay, so so what, 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 what you really want to be getting from this limit is a bit more than just the metric and the clock. You would want to get what's called um, a Newton Cartan structure. So, what's a Newton Cartan structure? It's, um, it's a triple consisting of a symmetric connection, um, a contravariant uh, form of signature zero three. So it's not, not, it's not a metric because it's degenerate and, and of uh, his upper indices and the one form theta. And, uh, and, and they have to be compatible in that, in that uh, they preserved by this uh, connection. So both theta and H are parallel with respect to the connection. And um, because theta is parallel with respect to the connection and the connection is torsion free, which I should have said at the beginning, you in particular see that theta is close, so locally exact. So, so, so this, this Newton Cartan structure is theta we care about, but there is also a local notion of time. Um, you need, you know. To, to, so the vibration, this form theta gives you a notion of time simultaneity, uh, but to describe a free fall, uh, so to connect two points corresponding to different values of time, different events, uh, it's not enough to have this metric H on the fibers in some other structure to find preferred curves. And, and this is this connection which gives you some geodesics. So there is absolute time, but there isn't an absolute space that needs a choice of, of some coordinates. 
So this is the structure which you would want to get from this non-relativistic crystal theory. But yes. That's right. So, so the, the so the the vectors, you know, the, the it's it's an integrable using this language. It's a, the, theta gives you an integrable distributions and and the vector, the three dimensional three dimensional integrable distributions and and the the, the vectors spanning these distributions are you know d by dx, d by dy, d by dz. Okay, so we miss what we're missing so far is this connection. We've derived the metric and the one form from these non-relativistic crystals, but not the uh, connection. So how do you do that? Well, you, you have to, you know, uh, this connection is, is, is curved. So you would want to start off not with a one parameter uh, family of flat twister spaces, but curved ones. Well, those, as I said, don't exist in Lorentzian signature, but they do exist in Riemannian signature. And they, they, they put constraints on what sort of metrics you, you can have. And one, and the metrics have to be self-dual. Now, um, everybody's favorite explicit self-dual Ricci flat metrics, as, you know, described by Twister theory, uh, is um, it's called Gibbons Hawking. Ansatz, Gibbons Hawking class. Uh, and they given uh, in terms of a one form and a, um, and a harmonic function. So A is a one form of, on R3 and B is a, a function on R3, satisfy a monopole equation. I'm modifying this, this Gibbons Hawking uh, Ansatz and I'm trying to do so carefully. So there is a parameter epsilon here. So, so, so those of you who, who've seen this type of metrics before would, would have seen this flat metric multiplied by V and then, uh, and, and then uh, this bracket here multiplied by one over V. I'm, I'm replacing V by one plus epsilon V. And I, I claim, and that can be checked that with this kind of powers of epsilon chosen here, uh, this metric is anti-self-dual and Ricci flat for all epsilons in, in, in positive reals, as long as star dv equals dA. So when one, this is called the monopole equation. One consequence of this monopole equation is that v is a harmonic function. It happens if you d this equation um, once again. Okay, so, so you really have one parameter family of, for any fixed v and a, you have one parameter family of Gibbons Hawking um, matrix and they all admit twister description. And this parameter epsilon is related to uh, the speed of light. And in fact, it has to be epsilon is one over C squared. Now, um, what happens, um, I, I see, and, and, there is a, and, and there is a deformed twister space corresponding to this Gibbons Hawking type matrix where the patching relations in, in, in this QT coordinate system, the patching relation looks looks like this and and the the, the deformation is given but that's probably a bit too technical but it's given by by certain cohomology class. now what's less technical but but remarkable is what happens in the limit where c goes to infinity or where um, epsilon goes to zero well um we said epsilon equal to zero nothing drastic happens with this term but this term blows up so the metric blows up. But what you can do is you can compute uh, for any value of epsilon, you can compute the levi civita connection, the Christoffel symbols of this metric, and, and you take a limit at the level of this Christoffel symbols. And when you do that, you find that this limit exists. They, uh, some of the Christoffel symbols will die in that limit, but the limit is not singular, and the Christoffel symbols which stay are these. So, and, and there is also, you know, in that limit, you, you can recover this inverse metric on the fibers H, I, J, as well as, as theta. So there is actually, I'm, I'm not telling you the whole story. You, you're not, that there is a procedure which from the limit recovers not only the connection, but also H and theta. And, but, but what you find is that as long as B is harmonic function, um, that is your, you know, that is your non-relativistic limit of Gibbons Hawking space. But because it had a twister description, you can take this limit at the 
twist level, and you can understand this Newton Cartan connection historically. And what happens is um, you know, this homology class F, which deforms the twister space, comes to this. So on the non relativistic twister space, there is a cohomology class, a twister function, which um, gives rise to a function on, um, on Newtonian space time. So to evaluate this function at the point, you have to integrate over a contour in the corresponding twister line. This function will automatically be harmonic and it gives rise to this connection. So a um, concrete example, this twister function for the uniform gravitational field I, I talked about at the beginning is Q square over lambda squared. Um, an example, another example corresponds to one over R type potentials, or they arise from a limit of tau naught gravitational instantons, and they require this F to be taken. And there is some you know, interesting feature of taking a limit at the level of space time. So this is um, the, 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 the relativistic space corresponding to this potential. <clears throat> is asymptotically locally flat, belongs to this ALF class, but in the limit it actually belong, becomes asymptotically flat. But, 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 okay, but that brings me to an end. So I, I gave you a dense, I'm afraid, too dense summary of this non-relativistic twister theory. And at the beginning of the talk, I, 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 I've told you about Roger's view of this R process, which, which is, which is you know, he claims takes place in time. What can the two, um, approaches and how do you bring them together where here is a um, proposal okay and, and this i mean i think what I, what I told you so far i mean i might not have done best of jobs by explaining it but but it, you know if you look at the papers our paper other papers it's it's, 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 it's solid right M mathematics i mean un unless there are some gaps we did not see but it's i i didn't smuggle anything in. this is a this is a to large extent a speculation and i'll be honest about which of the steps in particular is speculative, but here it goes. So let's assume that the R process happens between two measurements uh, at times T0 and T1. And people who think deeply about quantum mechanics would not necessarily agree with this assumption. I think there are other approaches to the R process. That's what we assume. Now, um, the, um, we do it in Newtonian framework. So space time is, described by the Newtonian twister space. The first measurement um, results in the discontinuous jump in space-time structure. So there is something drastic which happens to space-time, but we'll claim that the twister space survives. It introduces enough curvature to lead to some deformation of a twister space. And we want this cohomology class deforming the twister space to only be non-zero between two values of capital T. Remember, capital T is this global twister function which you have in the non-relativistic case. Uh, so the twister space survives the reduction, but because of this um, deformation, it, it suffers this Kodaira instability. So the four parameter family of curves with normal bundle O plus O2 jump into a different four parameter family of curves. And, and mathematically, that, that, that piece is enough to be expected because the, I mean, it's one way to say that, that, that a, a complex manifold is stable un, under um, infinitesimal deformations, but another way to, to claim that some family of sub-manifolds of these complex manifolds is stable. And, and that's measured by this H1 with values in the endomorphisms of the normal bundle, which when you compute it for this normal bundle, that's non-zero. Um, well, the, the, the measurement then is, is caused by some interaction with environment. But, but that, that's the main problem, how to describe when the measurement takes place in spots, the new process, and suddenly I have to do something about the shadow that is such a stop from involving cohomological. What, what is this? Dynamic of process that, that forces you to make a measure. Okay, so that, that I, I mean, I, 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 I that's a question. I, I'm not qualified to answer this, and I, I'm not sure whether anyone is, but, but whatever, I mean, our proposal doesn't address that. 
will say that there is a measurement which takes place between two parts. Yeah, but you say that it takes it is at some specific time moment, whether it takes time or it doesn't take time. It, 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 it takes time, but as I understand your question, you what triggers it. So how do I know that this is T0 and not T0 minus two seconds? Yes. So I don't know that. Right, but no. But you assume that it is a specific moment of time. It's correct. It take time the measurement process. Um, yeah, since we don't. So, sorry, no, no. I, have I, have I, uh, well, the, what I want to say is that it does take time. Well, okay, so there, are, there is the measurement process and there is the reduction of the wave function. Yes. And it is the reduction of the wave function which takes time. Okay. Uh, but that is. You're going to tell me that it's not the same as saying that the measurement takes time. No. And I agree with that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, okay. So that's what happens. Um, and, and then, uh, okay. So he, he, here, here's, here's a model. I mean, what, what the kind of pictorial model of, of, of our steps. So the space time then bifurcates and collapses in, in the R process. But, but the twister space is one complex free fold and it survives the R process. But the the, the, the holomorphic curves corresponding to space-time points in this, um, in the twister space you know, during the R process, change their holomorphic time. Now, um, so, so I mean, I, I should, I mean, that's where I stop, but I want to be crystal clear where, where it's, it's kind of far-fetched. I mean, where is the maths to be done to, to make this, even the, the proposal so sort of mathematically rigorous. So, it, 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 it's here, you see, where I say that f is non-zero between t0 and t1. So all, the, all this deformation theory, um, Kodaira Spencer deformation of complex manifolds and sub-manifolds, which really underlies a technical level twister theory, it is, is done in the real analytic category. So, so these are complex manifolds and, and these cohomology classes are holomorphic in intersections of two open sets. So I'm not really allowed to say, I'm afraid, but something is non-zero between T0 and T1. I mean, such, you know, such functions don't exist. There are no analytic functions of, 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 this, of this type. Um, so so this, um, this F might be smooth, but it's not holomorphic. And it's, um, so at a technical level, you want to see, which, which is what we've tried, but, but so far it's far from complete, whether the bits of the deformation theory we need really rely on F being holomorphic or can it be just smooth, but not really analytic. So that's, that's the kind of, as I see, the, the, the weakness of the proposal, but, but you know, if, if you take, take, take that on board. Good, yeah, okay. Um, well, well, okay. So, so, so there. So, so, what's the? So, in the in the relativistic context, they you know that there are twister formulae for solutions of linear massless fields. Right, and and at the, I mean, going back to this Eisenhardt picture. Well, they're not functions on the twister space, but there is this, this concept of Penrose transform, which tells you given some function on the twister space, you need to integrate it along a certain contour in, in a, if you want to evaluate the wave function at the space time point, you need to take, yes. Okay, so that's, that's it, that's, that's the proposal. I'm curious if there is, is there a way to see? Is somebody online? I don't know how to see it. Uh, somebody wants to ask a question? If we go away from 
Uh, if we go away from holomorphicity of this F, so that we can, in a sense, incorporate the, 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 the in a sense, from zero to none and then back to zero or whatever, the F, so that between, what goes wrong with the whole thing if F is not holomorphic in an, it's not, it's, holom, it's non holomorphic, let's say, so that we can switch it on and then switch it off at times T0 and T1, because that's the idea, in a sense, of this R process. What, 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 what goes wrong with the kind of theory takes how do you, have, you have a complex manifold, and then it's useful, right? And you have, you have a complex sub-manifold, that's a useful curve. And these curves correspond to points. And one has one curve, you have four around the family. Now, um, to Roger's idea of nonlinear gravity construction, how do you introduce curvature is this. You, you first deform a complex manifold, and how you do it is you, you cover it by two open sets with some patching relations, and you deform these patching relations in infinitesimal. And, and there is, you know, and there is like a theorem one of twister theory, which, which I learned that Roger learned from Michael Latia is that if you know if if you do it, there are obstruction, all obstruction groups which need to vanish, vanish, and the complex manifold survives the deformation. You have a new complex manifold. Then there is question to what happens with this uh, twister lines, the space-time points or the submanifolds. So that's a more subtle question, whether these submanifolds um, survive the deformation if you're um, you know, if, if, if you deform the patching relation. Now, uh, so th that requires the cohomology you use for deformation to be holomorphic. If, it, if it's not holomorphic, that it might be that you've deformed the complex manifolds, but there are no sub-manifolds anymore. There are no space-time points. Now I know from it, which I understand is that the holomorphic type of these twister curves will need to change under the deformation. It'll jump to, the relativistic twister space. But, but, but with this, you know, what I insist on with this F being only non-zero between T0 and T1, I, I don't know to what extent this, um, you know, wh whether these curves survive the deformation at all. Uh, but, you know, this, this Kodaira Spencer paper is quite technical and I've, um, you know, I, 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 I did study them in, back in my days when I was learning my, you know, doing my PhD but I never understood what happens in the non-holomorphic category. But, but what can go wrong is that you deform the complex manifold and you throw all the submanifolds. Yeah, that was my question about T0 and T1. If yeah. we are non-holomorphic, that may be question whether it happened at T0 or at T1 is a long, wrongly posed question because maybe there is no a point in space-time point where it happened from that perspective because I cannot really in a sense, associate a space-time point with the measurement if this is non-holomorphic. That's my question. Um, That's well, a fuzzy, fuzzy idea in a sense of a space-time point if you have a non-holomorphic thing in twister theory, as far as I understand. Uh, that is true. Um, Well, I mean, the, the point, so the, these lines that I draw here, the blue thing here, the green thing at the top, and this, this multicolored thing in the middle, they are the space time points. Uh, I mean, the, tw the twist, yeah, the twister space um, is holomorphic, it's non holomorphic, is this. F, which would be forms. Um, once you've agreed that the deformation took place, you have new space time points. Um, but you, yeah, I mean, now you pin it down. You, you worry at what happens at the, exactly at T0. Where, 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 where exactly, where yes. Well, I, mean, I don't know. I mean, more, more work on the math side is, is required, but maybe 
it, it's all fundamentally kind of uh, kind of thought or based on wrong assumptions on, on physical ground. But you know, I'm, I just I just um, learned to be a believer in Rogers' intuition and the, the, this this idea of the measurement process. Yeah, no, not not the measurement. The R process taking place in time. Uh, I, I I find it. I, I don't you know. I think it's quite spooky to say that <laughs> if you if you look you know. If there is a wave function of a harmonic oscillator and you choose to measure it or hydrogen atom, you measure the energy state of a hydrogen atom, then um, instantaneously the wave function collapses in the entire universe to some, you know, to some of this, uh, some wave function corresponding to this energy vector. I mean, that's a, which is what I think the Copenhagen interpretation also to be. Yes, I don't want to argue with Roger's intuition at all, but maybe the interval between T0 and T1 is not a sharp, sharply defined interval. That's what I want to argue. That if it is if it is not holomorphic, then the interval has a fuzzy ending, ends in a sense. So that T0 is slightly diluted and T1 is slightly diluted if it is not strictly holomorphic, because I cannot assign a strict space-time point then with this T0 and T1. That's 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 what I want to say by this. Um, but the interval is slightly fuzzy or well that, that, that would make things maybe better because you know you wouldn't have to say that some zero outside an interval exactly outside. exactly you would have some more you maybe say that it's small but, but, but in this interval it's yeah. less small yeah it switches on and switches off but i don't say that it's at but is it about sharp about, moment but isn't it in, in the reduction in the reduction in this r process Shouldn't one assume that it really starts at some given time? In put Twister Fury aside all this, how do people really people think about it? How do we understand the R process? No. Uh, it doesn't have to start at some sharp time, because saying that it starts at sharp time, you would have to have the resolution until Planck scale or whatever of energies. So, so it is inaccessible to say that it starts sharply at this time T0 and ends sharply at T1, because that statement in physics would mean that you have infinite frequencies at your disposal, and you don't. So, But if, but if that's the case, then there should be something which precedes the, the, the R process. So you know, before the wave function collapses, there is, should be some evidence that it's just about to collapse, and I don't think anything like it has been observed. Yes, but you know, physically, I'm opposed to this statement that something happens sharply at time t0, because that means that I have infinite frequencies at my disposal, and I don't. Therefore, it has to be somehow diluted in time, because I have only some limited uh, frequency interval at my disposal. So that's why saying that something happens at T0, already I'm opposing to such a statement, because you cannot say this from the physical point of view, and you want to describe a physical process by this. That's my objection, in a sense, to saying that something starts at T0 and was exactly zero before, and is exactly zero after T1. Right. Is that that? Sorry, I cannot take it back. I think I think I mean to be a uh, poor attempt to defend myself. I, mean, I, I maybe I've written, um, maybe I've written, which I have written, that the R process happens between two measurements at T zero and T one. So I didn't actually say that it starts at T zero and T one. I said it happens in between. Maybe not the same. Maybe it's a bit weaker. Okay. Okay. So, okay. So thank you very much.